you. Good morning. Good morning. Good music, huh? I will not be singing this morning. Well, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak once again before the Independent Community Bankers of America. This is the sixth consecutive year I've met with you at this event, and the themes of my remarks over the years tell a story not only about the financial and economic upheaval that we've experienced, but also about many of the difficult issues that continue to confront both bankers and policymakers. Back in 2006, less than two months after I started as chairman, I spoke to you about the strong performance of community banks as well as about some longer-term economic challenges. In subsequent years, my remarks touched on the need to strengthen regulation and supervision of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, approaches to reducing preventable mortgage foreclosures, community banking and the financial crisis, and then last year, the need to address the problem of financial institutions that are too big to fail. My themes today are the vital role that community banks need to play in our economic recovery, the value that the Federal Reserve places on insights from community banks, and the evolving regulatory environment. To me, the title of the 2009 ICBA annual report, Empowering Main Street, is a concise and accurate description of the critical role the community banks are playing in the U.S. economy. Community bankers live and work where they do business, and their institutions have deep roots, sometimes established over several generations. They know their customers, and they know the local economy. Relationship banking is therefore at the core of community banking. The largest banks typically rely heavily on statistical models to assess borrowers' capital, collateral, and capacity to repay. And those approaches can add value but banks whose headquarters and key decision makers are hundreds or thousands of miles away inevitably lack the in-depth local knowledge that community banks use to assess character and conditions when they make their credit decisions. This advantage for community banks is fundamental to their effectiveness and cannot be matched by models or algorithms, no matter how sophisticated. The IBM computer program Watson may play a mean game of Jeopardy, but I wouldn't judge it to trust the creditworthiness of a fledgling local business or to build long-standing personal relationships with customers and borrowers. Given the important role that community banks play in their local economies, we at the Federal Reserve are keenly interested in their health and their collective future. Local communities, ranging from small towns to urban neighborhoods, are the foundation of the U.S. economy, and communities need community banks to help them grow and prosper. As I'm sure you're all too aware, the financial crisis and its aftermath have hit some community banks especially hard, and those institutions will continue to need time to repair their balance sheets. But although we're not where we'd like to be yet, the good news is that many community banks are recovering and are reporting stronger performance. Indeed, despite some of the worst economic conditions since the Great Depression and their own strained balance sheets, community banks have already been doing their part to meet the credit needs of their customers, notably including their small business customers. We've been spending a lot of time at the Federal Reserve trying to understand and promote lending to small businesses. And one of the interesting things we found is that while small business lending contracted overall from mid-2008 through 2010, this contraction was not uniform. In fact, a majority of the smallest banks, those with assets of $250 million or less, actually increased their small business lending during this period. And while banks with assets between $250 million and $1 billion showed a slight decline in small business lending over this period, the contraction was not nearly as sharp as it was for the largest banks. This is hard evidence that underscores the important benefits of relationship banking particularly in periods of unusual financial and economic stress. You may recall in my remarks to this group last year, I noted the decentralized structure of the Federal Reserve System with 12 reserve banks and 24 branches 
located in cities across the country, was designed to ensure that local insights and information would be incorporated in the deliberations of both the board and the Federal Open Market Committee. During the debates leading up to the passage of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Act, we emphasized that our supervisory responsibility for state chartered banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System and bank holding companies of all sizes not only provides valuable economic information at the grassroots level that would be very difficult to replace, it also gives us at the Federal Reserve a fuller picture of the nation's financial system. At the same time, the range of expertise that the Federal Reserve develops in making monetary policy and in its engagement with the financial system allows us to bring unique insights and value added to our supervisory activities. Fortunately, with the ICBA's help, the Congress decided to preserve the Federal Reserve's existing supervisory authority over smaller as well as larger banking organizations. And it also broadened the Federal Reserve's connections to Main Street by adding hundreds of thrift holding companies to the institutions that we supervise. We are delighted that through our supervision, our gathering of economic intelligence, and the activities of our community affairs departments throughout the country, we'll be able to remain fully engaged with Grassroots America. The Federal Reserve has undertaken several recent initiatives to enhance our interactions with community banks and to ensure that we fully take their perspectives and their unique characteristics into account in our policymaking. First, for many years, the board has had a committee of governors that provides oversight on bank supervisory and regulatory matters. Although many of this committee's efforts in the wake of the financial crisis have understandably been focused on the largest and most complex organizations, the board believes it's important to sharpen our focus on the smaller banking organizations as well. And as a result, we recently established a special supervision subcommittee that focuses on community banks and smaller regional institutions. This subcommittee is chaired by a former longtime community banker, Governor Betsy Duke, and also includes a former state banking commissioner, Governor Sarah Bloom Raskin. This subcommittee provides leadership and oversight on a variety of matters related specifically to our supervision of community and smaller regional banks. In particular, this subcommittee is reviewing new policy proposals through the lens of the effects that those proposals could have on smaller institutions, both in terms of safety and soundness, and also in terms of potential regulatory burden. Among other things, the subcommittee is also monitoring the Federal Reserve's working relationship with state banking supervisors, which is particularly important because we share with them supervisory responsibility for state member banks. We've also undertaken an initiative to solicit feedback from community banks on a more regular basis. In October, the board announced that it would form a Community Depository Institutions Advisory Council to provide insight and information on the economy, lending conditions, and other issues of interest to community banks. To make this council as representative as possible, each of the 12 reserve banks around the country now has its own local advisory council comprising representatives from banks, thrift institutions and credit unions, while one member from each local council will serve on a national council that will meet with the board twice each year in Washington. Local meetings have already begun, and the first meeting of the national council with the board will take place soon. Personally, I'm looking forward to hearing more from community bankers about issues ranging from their local economies to regulatory reform. As you know, a key challenge for community banks in the years ahead will be to adapt to the changing regulatory environment, particularly the regulatory reforms contained in the Dodd-Frank Act, as well as the changes that will be associated with Basel III. We are certainly aware of and appreciate the concerns that community banks have about these regulatory changes. And as I've just described, we have stepped up our efforts to understand those concerns and to respond to them as appropriate. I think it's worth emphasizing here that the changes we will be seeing in the financial regulatory architecture are principally directed at our largest and most complex financial firms, including non-banks. Consequently, one benefit of the reforms should be the creation 
of a more level playing field for financial institutions of all sizes. Focusing reform on our largest, most complex financial firms makes sense. The recent financial crisis highlighted the fact that some financial firms had grown so large, leveraged, and interconnected that their failure could pose a threat to overall financial stability. The sudden collapse of major financial firms were among the most destabilizing events of the crisis. The crisis also demonstrated the inadequacy of the existing framework for supervising, regulating, and otherwise constraining the risks of major financial firms, as well as of the toolkit that the government had at the time to manage their failure. As I discussed with you at last year's meeting, a major thrust of the new regulation is addressing the too-big-to-fail problem and mitigating the threat to financial stability posed by so-called systemically important financial firms. The too-big-to-fail problem is a pernicious one that has a number of substantial harmful effects. Critically, it reduces the incentives of shareholders, creditors, and counterparties of such firms to discipline excessive risk-taking. And it produces competitive distortions by enabling firms with large systemic footprints to fund themselves more cheaply than other firms because of the implicit subsidy from their too-big-to-fail status. This competitive distortion is not only unfair to smaller firms and damaging to competition, but it also spurs further growth by the largest firms and more consolidation and concentration in the financial industry. A financial system dominated by too-big-to-fail firms cannot be a healthy financial system. The Act addresses this too-big-to-fail problem with a multi-pronged approach. Under it, we are developing more stringent prudential standards for banking firms with assets greater than $50 billion and for all non-bank financial firms designated as systemically important by the Financial Stability Oversight Council. These more stringent standards will include stronger capital and leverage requirements, liquidity requirements, and single counterparty credit limits as well as requirements to periodically produce resolution plans and to conduct stress tests. Our goal is to produce a well-integrated set of rules that meaningfully reduces the probability of failure of our largest, most complex financial firms, and that minimizes the losses to the financial system and to the economy if such a firm should fail. In doing so, we aim to force these firms to take into account the costs that they impose on the broader financial system to soak up the implicit subsidy that these firms enjoy due to market perceptions of their systemic importance, and to give firms regulatory incentives to shrink their systemic footprint. Complementing these efforts, the Federal Reserve has been working for some time with other regulatory agencies and central banks from around the world to design and implement a stronger set of prudential requirements for large, internationally active banking firms. These efforts include the agreements reached in December on the major elements of the new Basel III Prudential Framework for large, globally active banks. Basel III should make the financial system more stable and reduce the likelihood of future financial crises by requiring large banks to hold more and better quality capital and more robust liquidity buffers. A more stable financial system will benefit all banking institutions and, of course, our economy as a whole. We're working to adopt the Basel III framework in the United States in a timely manner. A central issue that we and the other banking agencies face in implementing Basel III in the United States is deciding how these capital rules will be applied for banks that are not systemic or internationally active. In doing so, we recognize the importance of striking the right balance between promoting safety and soundness throughout the banking system and keeping the compliance costs for smaller banking firms as low as possible. Also, to minimize the impact of the new capital rules on credit availability while the global economy is still recovering, we and our international colleagues have agreed to allow long transition periods for the implementation of the new standards. In addition to stricter regulation and supervision of large financial firms, the Dodd-Frank Act places new checks on the growth by acquisition of our major financial firms. 
It expands current restraints on acquisitions by bank holding companies to include a broader range of acquired firms, not just banks, and a broader range of liabilities, not just deposits. This tightening of the rules, this expansion, reflects a financial system that has changed in important ways since 1994, when the Congress first adopted concentration limits for banks and bank holding companies. The Act also imposes new restrictions on the capital market activities of banking firms, restrictions that will disproportionately affect the structure and the profitability of the largest banking firms. For example, the so-called Volcker Rule will restrict the ability of banking firms to engage in proprietary trading of securities and derivatives and to invest in or sponsor private investment funds. Among the most important aspects of the Act are the measures that it authorizes to reduce the financial and economic effects of the failure of a large firm. A clear lesson of the past few years is that the government must not be forced to choose between bailing out a systemically important firm and having it fail in a disorderly and disruptive manner. Instead, we need the tools to resolve a failing firm in a market and in a way that preserves market discipline by ensuring that shareholders and creditors incur losses and that culpable managers are replaced, and that at the same time we are cushioning the broader financial system from any destabilizing effects from the firm's collapse. Of course, such a framework has been in place for several decades now, as you know, for banks. The Dodd-Frank Act will create an analogous framework for systemically important non-bank financial firms, including bank holding companies. Resolving a large multinational financial firm safely will likely always be a difficult challenge, and a great deal of work remains to be done to make these authorities fully effective. Ultimately, though, these changes will mitigate moral hazard in our financial system by reducing expectations of government support by the creditors and counterparties of large firms. Taken together, the measures I've described should give us a financial system that is safer, more efficient, and more equitable. In short, two key objectives of financial regulatory reform are first, addressing the problems that emerged in the largest, most complex financial firms during the crisis, and second, creating a better balance with respect to regulation and oversight between banks and non-bank financial firms. The Federal Reserve believes that these are the right goals for reform. We are committed to working with the other U.S. financial regulatory agencies to implement the Act and related reforms in a manner that both achieves the law's key objectives and appropriately takes into account the risk profiles and business models of smaller banking firms, including community banks. Before I conclude my remarks, let me just say a few words about the transfer of thrift holding company supervisory authority to the Federal Reserve. We've been working closely with the Office of Thrift Supervision, the Office of the Controller of the Currency, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to make this transfer as smooth as possible, and progress so far has been good. The Federal Reserve believes that any company that controls the depository institution should be held to appropriate prudential standards including those for capital, liquidity, and risk management. And as such, we intend to create an oversight regime for thrift holding companies that is consistent with and is as rigorous as the supervisory regime we apply to bank holding companies. That said, we appreciate that thrift and bank holding companies differ in important ways, play different roles in our economy, and will remain governed by different statutes. We will be mindful of these differences and of the unique characteristics of the thrift industry as we develop our supervisory approach for thrift holding companies. My colleague and former community banker, Governor Duke, recently told our examiners that community bankers are creative, committed, stubborn, and resilient. And I know she won't remind my repeating that sentiment here, and I'm sure most of the community bankers in the room would wear those words as a badge of honor. Community banks face substantial challenges in the months and years to come, including still difficult economic conditions, continued uncertainties in real estate and other key markets, and a changing regulatory environment. But community banks have faced difficult times before, and the industry has remained vibrant and resilient. I am completely confident that community banking will successfully navigate these new challenges as well. 
Let me thank you. Let me thank you for what you do every day to meet the needs of your communities and to help our, com our communities and our economy to grow stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman Bernanke has kindly agreed to answer a couple of questions. Mr. Chairman, the Federal Reserve was tasked by statute to address debit interchange. Community banks and many bank regulators have expressed concern that the so-called carve-out for community banks does not work in the marketplace. We fear potential debit interchange rules may harm community banks and their customers. Can you discuss where the Fed is on evaluating debit interchange, please? Thank you, and congratulations on your, your new role. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, we've been working really hard on this rule. Um, it is a difficult one. We've had about 50 staff working on this for full time for about six months, uh, collecting information, trying to understand this market as completely as possible. As you know, we put out a preliminary rule, and we got back over 11,000 comments, each of which has to be analyzed and responded to. So we have our work cut out for us. As you think about uh, debit interchange, you should understand, and I think many of you do, that there are really two parts to the law. Uh, the first part, which establishes a standard for uh, debit uh, interchange fees and relates them to, um, uh, to the cost, the incremental cost of, of, of a transaction, uh, has a carve-out. And that carve-out is for issuers that uh, have li uh, liabilities or assets less than $10 billion. Uh, so I'm sure that includes uh, most of you in this room. Um, to make that uh, carve out eff uh, efficacious, we need a cooperation from the networks uh, so that they will be willing to uh, pay different fees to different, uh, different issuers. So far, uh, many of the largest networks have announced that they will be uh, managing a tiered fee system uh, and to the extent that that happens, that will help differentiate the fees received by the smaller and the larger issuers. The second part of the law, though, relates to uh, the networks that merchants use to, uh, to put through their uh, debit uh, charges. And in particular, it creates more competition so that merchants will have more choices about which way they want to route their, their transactions. This part of the law does not have an exemption for smaller institutions. And overall, more competition in this market will probably bring some pressure on interchange fees. And that will be probably uh, across the board. So there are a number of forces in play. Um, I do think there will be some differentiation, but it will take a while for us to know exactly entirely how it will work out. But let me just say one thing, which is that at the Federal Reserve, we are quite aware that the Congress, in writing this law, intended for smaller issuers to be exempt, carved out from the broader uh, statute. And in our rule writing, we will do everything we can and use all the powers we have to try to make sure that that carve out is effective. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Basel Rule 3s are pending and community banks want to know with confidence how capital requirements may affect their ongoing ability to lend. How do you see Basel III impacting the financial sector landscape, please? So I've been spending a lot of time flying to Switzerland. It's not as much fun as you might think it is. Uh, we've been talking about the Basel III uh, rules. Uh, we think these are very important. Uh, it's certainly clear from the crisis that it's absolutely essential that we have a financial system that can continue to operate during a period of stress, continue to provide credit to our economy. And under Basel III, we will be asking banks to hold more capital, better capital, uh, have better risk management, have better liquidity management, so that we have a stronger financial system overall. Now, as I mentioned in my remarks, the Basel III is, is designed primarily with large, internationally active, complex financial firms in mind. Um, we have not, uh, and I say we, the banking agencies in the United States and abroad, have not yet determined to what extent and how some of these uh, improvements will be uh, applied to smaller institutions. 
What I can say is at this point that they are, again, very much focused on the largest institutions. For example, uh, the largest institutions with uh, assets over 50 billion uh, will have additional capital requirements over and above the basic requirements. Uh, many of the activities of the largest, most complex banks will be targeted. For example, uh, additional capital for the trading book, additional capital for over-the-counter derivatives uh, trading and, and, and supply, um, tougher liquidity rules that will uh, make it uh, more costly to rely on, say, short-term volatile wholesale funding as opposed to retail deposits and the like. So our focus is, again, on those systemic firms whose uh, stability is critical for the overall safety of the system. Um, we do know and we do understand that, uh, first, that uh, it's going to take time both for the regulators to get a good grip on these changes and also, of course, for banking institutions to, to implement them. Uh, and in addition, we certainly don't want to take any actions that will constrain credit and reduce lending in a period when the economy still needs to recover and in which credit remains uh, less than uh, where we would like it to be. And so to try to help that situation, other than differentiating across types of institutions, we're also making sure that there's a very long phase-in period. So the phase-in period uh, for the various provisions of Basel III now runs from 2013 to 2019. And it's our hope that by creating such a long period that we'll give both enough time for financial institutions to adapt to and uh, understand these rules, and at the same time to make sure that there's not any uh, restriction of lending, which, as I said before, community banks are doing to help our economy recover. Thank you again for inviting me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you.